this is one of the topics that many people actually don't really understand and we see a lot of weird things happening in labor ward a lot of people panicking whenever it's a breach delivery a lot of jrmos not being sure of what they must do when it comes to a breach delivery remember that you can perform a breach delivery for example in multiple gestations even just in single tone deliveries so i thought i should put together this lecture to help you understand about breach delivery grab your piece of paper and let's go Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at breach delivery. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such amazing content every time I post. Grab your piece of paper, grab your pen, and let's go. So remember that a normal presentation in pregnancy towards term and even just before delivery is a cephalic uh, presentation. Of course, it would be vertex presentation. So in breech presentation, you have the fetal part, which are the buttocks that are presenting first. And the incidence is about 3.5% when the child is near term, but it's much greater early in pregnancy, around 14%. Remember that these are found in early in pregnancy and most of them are actually going to spontaneously convert to a vertex presentation as they approach term. But the major risk why we should be wary of vaginal deliveries, especially with breach, is sometimes the aftercoming head can become stuck. And remember, every breach delivery that you do, there is some sort of asphyxia that is there. And then if the head is stuck, it means you have caused a big disaster for yourself, meaning that there should be a strict criteria on which women can deliver via breach extraction and which women cannot deliver via breach extraction. This is a summary, an overview of how to perform that breach delivery. So there are some risk factors that are associated with breach presentations. You could be divided as uterine, things like fibroids, uterine anomalies, uterine surgeries, oligohydramnios, polyhydramnios, and multiparity, and some fetal anomalies like low birth weight, which is seen in about 20 to 30% of the cases, congenital anomalies such as hydrocephalus or anencephaly, multiple gestations, placenta previa, as well as neuromuscular conditions. Remember that some of these risk factors are going to contraindicate a patient from delivering vaginally. For example, if someone has a breach and they have a placenta previa, no matter whether you're going to do your external cephalic vision, and that woman is not going to deliver via the vaginal delivery, especially if it's a major placenta previa. Now, how do you make a diagnosis of breach presentation? We can do this using our Leopold's maneuvers. And remember that you're going to feel the cephalic pole as this palpable uh, mass, which is felt in the fundus. So the head is going to be felt in the fundus and it's going to be feeling hard. It's going to be round. It's going to be mobile. And of course, there will be an indentation with the neck. The head can actually move independent of the rest of the body. That's how you know that this is a head. Then the inferior pole is going to be voluminous, it's going to be bigger than the head, it's going to be irregular and it's less hard and it's less mobile than the head. And of course, if you move that, it tends to move with the rest of the body. Then when you do your vaginal examination, if it's during labor, the vaginal examination is going to yield a soft mass, which is going to be divided by a cleft. That's the cleft in between the buttocks. Sometimes there may be a hard projection at the end of the cleft, which is obviously the coccyx and the sacrum. If the membranes actually rupture, you may sometimes feel the anus in the middle of the cleft and a foot sometimes can be felt. It's very difficult sometimes when you can actually mistake a hand for a foot and a face for a breech presentation. And sometimes we can discover it on ultrasound. There are predominantly three main types of breech that I want you to know. We have the frank breech, which is also referred to as the extended breech. We have the complete breach, which is also known as a flexed breach, and then we have the footling breach, which is an incomplete breach. Of these three, the frank breach is the most common. The footling breach is the least common, but the footling breach is one of the type of breach where you do not want to risk a woman actually to deliver because there's a high risk of foot prolapse, there's a high risk of cord prolapse, and there's a high risk of fetal 
morbidity and mortality. So you, if you have a foot link breach, you, you are better off delivering that woman via cesarean section. In terms of the frank breach or the extended breach, like I said, it's the most common type of breach. So we have the hips are going to be flexed, so they're going to be bent forward. The knees are also going to be um, rather the knees are also going to be extended. I think I added the wrong image here. The knees are going to be extended. This one here. Focus on the image at the bottom. The knees are going to be extended like that over the anterior surface of the body. So the feet are going to be towards the head or the face. So remember, this is the only kind of breach that can potentially deliver safely vaginally. And it's easier to deliver this vaginally, especially when the fetal attitude is that of flexion, especially the attitude of the head. Remember that the attitude is the relationship of the fetal parts to each other. And if the head is flexed, meaning the chin is on the chest, then that's going to be easier to deliver as opposed to it being extended where the occiput is at the back of the baby. That's going to be a very difficult delivery. Then complete breach is where they're going to be having the... Uh, uh, feet, uh, their lower limbs, their hip is going to be flexed. Their knees are also going to be flexed, they're going to be bent. So it's kind of like the fetal position, but the only difference is that this fetus is facing upwards, it's not facing downwards. So this one here is an unstable type of breach and it can easily convert into a footling breach. So they can also deliver vaginally, but there is a risk of it converting to a footling breach. There is a risk of foot prolapse, there is a risk of cord prolapse with this type of complete breach. Then in terms of footling breach, one or even both of the hips, so it could be a single footling breach or a double footling breach, are not flexed and the foot is going to be lying below the buttocks. This one carries a risk of cord prolapse, so you do not want to even deliver this woman vaginally. You want to take this woman for C-section. Now what are some of the contraindications to vaginal delivery? Of course, if there's a cord presentation, if there's fetal growth restriction or macrosomia, any presentation other than the frank or the complete breach, with uh, flexed or even neutral fe uh, fetal head attitude, the clinical clinically inadequate maternal pelvis, any fetal anomaly incompatible with vaginal delivery, or other conditions that are present that are precluding vaginal delivery, things like placenta previa. Now, how do we manage these patients? Remember, most of them are going to frequently require vaginal delivery, or rather cesarean section delivery, especially those that are coming in with a footling breach, for example. But the frank breach ideally can deliver vaginally. Even the complete breach to some extent can deliver vaginally, but it should be under strict criteria. And these are the prerequisites that you might look at when you're delivering a woman. So the first thing is that there should be no contraindication to vaginal delivery. The second thing is that the estimated fetal weight must be between 2.5 kg to about 4 kg, so it shouldn't be more than 4 kg. The gestational age should be 36 weeks or less. And then, of course, the attitude of the head should be that of flexion. So it means that the, the extension angle um, should be greater than 90 degrees. So it means that the chin of the babies should be on the chest. You can actually check this on the ultrasound where they should actually comment on the fetal attitude. So it should either be neutral or it should be that of flexion. Because if the head is extended, it's going to be very difficult to deliver. And this is going to be reported on ultrasound. So if they actually give you back an ultrasound without commenting on the fetal attitude, then we call that as an uninvestigated breach in terms of not the fact that we haven't done any investigations for this woman, but the very fact that they haven't commented on the fetal attitude in terms of the ultrasound. And of course, it should be a frank or a complete breach. Remember, incomplete breach is a contraindication. There should be adequate maternal uh, pelvis. This is going to be manifested by a good progress of labor. If there's a good progress of labor, then this is a good indicator of fetal pelvic proportion. There should be absence of any fetal anomalies that may cause dystocia. The ultrasound should be showing that there's no presentation of the cord. Even on your exam, there shouldn't be any cord prolapse or cord presentation. Then, of course, you should have some staff that is skilled in breach delivery, and you should have facilities to carry out cesarean section if this fails. Anesthesia must be ready, obstetrics must be ready, pediatrics must be ready, and even surgical facilities must be present. This woman, of course, must be fully dilated, full cervical dilatation to carry this out. And remember that epidural can sometimes be used in this woman because you want to minimize the pain so that you prevent them from pushing before they are fully dilated. So you should actually provide this anesthesia through this epidural analgesia 
and also because you're going to be doing certain maneuvers. And before labor, actually, there is a proportion of women that can undergo external cephalic version, and this should be done roughly at around 35 to 37 weeks of gestation. So if the cephalic version is contraindicated or it's unsuccessful, then breach alone, even in the absence of any other anomalies, strictly speaking, is not really a dystotic type of presentation and it's not an automatic indication for cesarean section. So you should be able to deliver them vaginally, even if they are premier paris women. And things that are going to be favoring vaginal delivery are things like, for example, a frank breach, a history of them having a vaginal delivery, whatever presentation it was. And if they have a normal progress in the dilatation during labor, then this is going to be a good indicator that there is an inadequate fetal pelvic proportion and this woman will give birth vaginally. So remember that when you're assessing dilatation in terms of a breech presentation, it's very difficult as opposed to the cephalic. Why is this so? Remember, you have a head which is hard that is pushing on the cervix. The cervix will dilate faster, and of course, it will reach a point where it's fully dilated and it completely disappears, and you can't really feel it around the presenting head, around the cephalic crown. Now, instead, in these people that have breech, the cervix is going to still remain palpable around the fetal trunk as it's going to be descending. So the descent is actually going to be regarded as adequate if the breech reaches the level of the ischial spines when the cervix is six centimeters dilated and it uh, reaches the pelvic flow at full dilatation. Remember that primary expulsive force uh, during the breech delivery of the fetal breech and even the trunk and the head is going to be through the mother's effort. So the mother must also be bearing down it at a certain point. A passive second stage where they perform delayed pushing can be done for up to 90 minutes. However, once this woman starts bearing down, if, you feel, if the breach fails to descend and the delivery fails to happen within 60 minutes, within an hour, then you must take this woman for cesarean section rather than performing a breach extraction. So I want to talk a little bit about external cephalic vision just before we go into the breach delivery. So remember, this is going to be done before labor. It's often going to be done between the ages of 35 to 37 weeks gestation, and it should be attempted to avoid any breach delivery. So the procedure itself is going to be maneuvering the infant into a cephalic position by applying pressure through the maternal abdomen. So the success rate is about 50%. And remember, this should be done by someone who's experienced. It's very uncomfortable and it must be carried out by a senior obstetrician that has delivery facilities nearby and your facilities to do the obstetric scans, your facilities to do the C-sections. So the woman is going to be lying comfortably and you can do this under ultrasound guidance and then you can manipulate the baby into a cephalic position. I'll show you a picture of how it's done. It carries a risk of placenta abruption. It carries a risk of fetal heart rate abnormalities and even the fetus reverting back to the malpresentation. Remember that the technique is going to be much easier in multiparous women, those that have a uterus that is already relaxed, but we do sometimes administer tocolytics such as nifedipine and it is actually much more difficult to do in women that are overweight and women that have fibroids and those where the part is deeply engaged and the fetal heart race uh, heart tracing must actually be done before you do the procedure and after you do the procedure most of the times it usually normalizes that if it's abnormal it will normalize within 30 minutes after you stop the procedure so if the procedure fails or it becomes difficult it should be abandoned so this is a picture that is showing you um, process of external cephalic vision. As we can see here on image A, we're trying to disengage the breach from the pelvic inlet. So we're going to be pushing it upwards like that so that we can disengage the part from down there in the pelvis. After you've done this, then we're going to have the version, which is usually performed in the direction of the flexion. As you can see, the head is in, so you should pop it and see where the occiput is and where the back is, and then this is going to be the face. So in this direction, you're going to be pushing this child counterclockwise. So in this direction is you're following my cursor. So this is going to come down there. This is going to be, this hand is going to be pushing upwards there until this is been completed, completely turned and you should use the shortest route possible. Some contraindications to external cephalic vision include placenta previa, oligohydramnios or polyhydramnios, a history of antipartum hemorrhage, previous cesarean section or any myomectomy scars on the uterus, any multiple gestations, any preeclampsia or hypertensive disorder, and if you're planning to deliver them by C-section anyways, so there is no point of actually turning them to a cephalic presentation. 
Now, coming back to our management of our breach delivery. When they are in labor, you want to monitor the dilatation every two to four hours. If the contractions are good and the adequate dilatation is happening, it's progressing very well, the fetal heart rate is regular, then you should carry out an expectant management. You don't want to rupture the membranes unless if the dilatation stops. If the uterine contractions are inadequate, then you can actually actively manage labor with oxytocin. You can augment with oxytocin. And then when you want to deliver this child, we use what is known as a no-touch technique. So obviously your woman is going to come in and they'll have an IV line. Everyone that you're admitting to the ward should have an IV line, at least a green cannula, before the expulsion actually start. In some cases, we may consider performing an episiotomy at expulsion. And remember that this episiotomy is going to be performed when the perineum is actually sufficiently distended by the fetal buttocks. So it's not so surprising to see that the lyrica is going to be meconium stained. In breach presentation, don't be surprised. The, the, micon, the lyqua may be meconium stained. It's a very common thing to see in breach deliveries. It's not necessarily a sign that this child is in fetal distress. So remember that the infant is going to be delivering unaided as a result of the mother simply just pushing and you just have to simply support um, that's going to be there by holding the infant by the bony parts, the hips and the sacrum without pulling, do not pull on the legs, do not afford any traction. We call that as a no touch technique. So once the umbilicus is out, then the rest of the delivery should be completed in three minutes. Otherwise, the cord compression will actually deprive this infant from getting oxygen. We should not touch our, the infant with our hands, so you should touch the infant with a towel because you want to avoid triggering this uh, reflex respirations from happening before you actually deliver the head. Then you should monitor the position of the fetal back because uh, this can actually impede rotation into the posterior position. So you should actually know where the fetal back is. So this is a picture of what is happening. As you can see, the buttocks are descending, they descend, they descend, there's some rotation that's happening, they hit. At this part, this is where you can actually run into some problems where this can get stuck. Now these two here, where the shoulders can get stuck or the head can get stuck, these are the two places where you can run into problems. And of course, once the head passes under the uh, symphysis, then you should be able to deliver this baby normally. So there are some problems that can incur and there are some maneuvers that you can use to solve these problems. So the first thing is posterior orientation. So if the back of the infant is posterior, when you are expelling, you don't want this to happen. You want the back to be anterior. So you just simply hold the hip with a towel and you simply turn the infant to the anterior position. This is going to be much easier to, to uh, deliver as opposed to the um, back facing the posterior position of the mother. Then the other thing is the obstructed shoulders. So the shoulders can sometimes get stuck, especially if the infant had the arms raised up above the shoulders as it's passing through the maternal pelvis. So there are two ways in which you can actually lower the shoulders, two maneuvers that you should actually know. One maneuver is known as love sets maneuver. So explain how you do it and then I'll show you images of how it's done. So the first thing is that you're going to be getting your thumb and um, your thumb is going to be over the infant's sacrum. Then you're going to hold the hip of this infant and the pelvis of this infant with the other fingers. Then you're going to simply turn the infant such that you're going to turn them 90 degrees such that their back now will be facing either the left side of the mother, or the left thigh of the mother, or the right thigh of the mother. So you're just going to rotate them either to the left or to the right such that the back of the infant is going to be facing either the left thigh or the right thigh. And once you do this, you're going to bring a shoulder which is going to be just underneath the symphysis pubis. That shoulder is known as the anterior shoulder. You simply then, what you're going to do is that you're going to bring that anterior shoulder underneath the symphysis, engage the arm, then you deliver that anterior shoulder. I'll show you a picture of how it's done. Then you do a 180 counter rotation or counterclockwise direction in the opposite side. If the back was facing the left side of the uh, mother, then it's going to be facing the right side now of the mother's thighs, then you deliver the posterior shoulder in that way. So what was now the posterior shoulder will now become the anterior shoulder. So this is what I mean. So as you can see, you're grasping the infant um, by the hip here, 
uh, with both hands, then of course you're going to be rotating them in that direction. So once you rotate them in that direction, you get this shoulder here that is going to be anterior. Once it reaches 90 degrees, going to be anterior to the mother. So you're going to have some downwards tractions and descent of the shoulder along the midline. And once this has been done, you can hook your index finger into the armpit and then actually deliver the anterior shoulder of the child. Then you rotate the child again and you get that posterior shoulder so that it comes now to become anterior and you repeat the procedure. That's the laugh sets maneuver. Then if the laugh sets maneuver actually fails, you can actually perform another maneuver which is known as the scissors maneuver. So in this case, if you have now turned the infant, you've tried it's not working. You can simply turn the infant to 90 degrees where the, where the back is going to be facing either the right thigh of the mother or the left thigh of the mother. Then you're simply going to pull the infant downwards. You insert one finger along the back of the infant so that you can look for the anterior arm. Then afterwards, you're going to use your thumb um, with your thumb and the in, in the infant's armpits and the middle finger along the arm, you're going to bring, you're going to like hook the arm and bring it outside. That's the anterior arm. So then you lift the infant upwards in order for you to deliver the posterior shoulder. So this is what I mean. So you're going to be turning the infant for the back to be facing either the left or the right side of the thigh. Then you're going to insert your finger and as you can see with your thumb hooked on the armpit and then with your uh, index finger over the arm, you're going to now bring it down and hook it over or and under this pubic symphysis. Then of course you're going to lift the legs upwards like that and you attempt the same thing, but now you're going to be doing it uh, with the posterior shoulder and delivering the posterior shoulder in that manner. This is what is known as Caesar's maneuver. Then the last thing is of course entrapment of the head, which is where most people get stuck. So the remember that the infant's head is actually bulkier than the rest of the body and it can actually get trapped in the mother's pelvis or soft tissue. So there are some various maneuvers that you can actually use to deliver the head by either flexing it as it's descending properly and then of course pivoting it around the uh, mother's pubic symphysis. Then these maneuvers must be done without delay because the infant should be allowed to breathe as soon as possible. Remember there is some asphyxia that is happening to a breech delivery that you're going to be carrying out. And all these maneuvers must be performed smoothly. You shouldn't pull on the infant. There shouldn't be any traction. So the first maneuver is known as the Bratz maneuver. So you have delivered the shoulders and the arms have been delivered. So after you deliver the arms, then the infant, you're going to grasp the infant by the hips. Then of course you're going to lift with both your arms and you're going to lift this child towards the mother's abdomen, towards the mother's stomach without actually pulling on the child. And then of course the neck is going to pivot around the symphysis like that and go under the symphysis. You can sometimes have an assistant apply some suprapubic pressure not fundal pressure, but suprapubic pressure. And this can actually facilitate the delivery of the after coming head. And if this maneuver actually fails, you can do another maneuver that's known as the modified Mauricio's um, maneuver. So here you are again going to rotate your infant such that now the back is going to be facing anteriorly. So the back is going to be facing anteriorly like that. So the occiput will just be underneath the pubic symphysis. And then of course you should kneel down to get some good angle of about 45 degrees downwards. And then of course with your non-dominant hand, you're going to now support this infant. Or with one of your hands, you're going to support the belly of this infant on the palm of your hand as well as the forearm. So you're going to support the infant on the hand and the forearm. Then you're going to insert your index finger and your middle finger of this uh, of this hand here, which is the dominant hand. You're going to be inserting your middle finger and your index finger inside the vagina. And what you're going to do is you place now your index finger and your middle finger over the maxilla of this infant. So once you've placed it over the maxilla, this other hand here, which is on top, is also going to be inserted and the index finger and the middle finger are going to be placed on either side of the neck. And then you're going to lower the head. So this here is going to be pushing, like pushing it downwards. Then this one is going to be like pulling it in that direction, like in this direction, like like I'm showing with the pointer coming like that, such that this is pulling, pushing in that direction. This is coming in that direction. Then you're able now to pivot the head 
underneath the symphysis. So the tip of the head and um, with the sweeping motion, like I told you, you're going to bring back to it back up towards the mother's abdomen and then pivot the occiput around the symphysis pubis like I've already explained. As you can see, these two fingers are across the maxilla. Never should you put them in the mouth because there's a risk that you may fracture the mandible. Then some super pubic pressure also can be applied here along the um, on the infant's head along the uh, pelvic axis, then this can help deliver the head. And if this fails, then you can carry out a last resort, which is known as a symphysiotomy, that can be done along with the modified Mauricial maneuver. Remember that sometimes you can use some forceps. Uh, forceps delivery of the aftercoming head can be done, but this should only be done by an experienced operator. I really hope you enjoyed this video on breech delivery. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel. Hit the bell notification icon so you never miss on such amazing content every time I post. Drop a like, drop a comment to show some support to Zambia and beyond. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.